Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be here. Wow, I'm just so lucky to get a chance to talk with each of you. You're really cool. I love it. I have the chance getting to meet with you, and I love to uh, do that. And right now, we have a chance to do something that raises the bar of coolness to a whole new level. And that is that we get a chance to hear from John Haskell, our person uh, here. Uh, Hazel, excuse me, why did I say that? Hazel, uh, John, who's uh, been r running behind the scenes, taking everything uh, under control. John, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning. Appreciate everyone's participation all week. I think it's been a good uh, three days. It's uh, great to be here Saturday morning. And we have a real treat. We hadn't planned on this, but this is uh, what we're going to do here to lead things off. Uh, we have a special speaker who can come up and speak for about 15 minutes and actually join the panel. On our, uh, We have a, a couple of governor candidates, one from each side. And um, they'll be coming up here answering questions about Colorado and also uh, getting things, talking about blockchain technology and cryptocurrency, which has never been done, as far as I know, in any form before. So we're really proud to have that today. Our uh, next guest coming up, I think you all know him, and uh, I'm excited to have him. It, it's, I, I had the experience of uh, getting a call saying, uh, he's interested in coming. You have to call him, though, in 45 minutes because he doesn't use a phone. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, I had a two-and-a-half-year-old and a four-and-a-half-year-old who just had gotten to a can of paint and uh, they were running around, I uh, had one in the shower, one was next to me full of blue paint. And I looked down at my phone, I have 5% battery life. So I look, I, well, okay. So I plug in the phone, I get the one child in the shower, the other one I've got uh, under control, and uh, call Jesse Ventura. So uh, I have Jesse Ventura, who will be coming out in a minute. And right away, as soon as uh, I said, uh, Jesse, hi, I'm John Hazel. I'm directing a cryptocurrency blockchain conference. I'd really love for you to come to it. It'd be great to, to have you uh, speak at it. And he says, John, I don't know anything about cryptocurrency <laughs> or the blockchain. I go, well, you don't have to, it's, that's fine. We want people to come up here with some other ideas and be able to share. Well, okay, I'm a dinosaur. I don't know about those things, but I guarantee if you get me up on stage, I'll say something. <laughs> so I don't know exactly what he'll say when he comes out, but I guarantee he'll say something. So I'm really proud to introduce Jesse Ventura. First of all, good morning. They told me it was 10 o'clock, and then they call me at 9 right when I'm getting out of the shower and say, you got to be here in 5 or 10 minutes. So please excuse me on that account. Anyway, it's wonderful to be here. Aspen, Colorado, never been here before. Been to Colorado, but never Aspen, but it's been very enjoyable. Uh, he's ex exactly right. I know nothing about this crypto stuff. You know, uh, an alternative to, I guess, the Federal Reserve, an alternative to money, a way to invest and all that, but I'm learning. And I think that's what the majority of people that show up here want to do, learn. Learn about this. Uh, if you don't know me, I'll give my background quickly. I, I was born and raised in South Minneapolis. I graduated from Minneapolis Roosevelt High School. Uh, I was proudly, a couple years ago, inducted into the first Hall of Fame at my high school, the first one they ever had. And we had quite a Minneapolis Roosevelt. We had quite a Hall of Fame. Uh, we had myself. We had uh, a gentleman named Mike Ramsey who if you don't remember that name, he was uh, part of what we call the Miracle on 80 when uh, our United States hockey team defeated the Russians in the upset of the century, or maybe two centuries. Uh, but Mike was a big defenseman on that team playing for Herb Brooks. Uh, John Vesey went to my high school, the former head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as we had a Nobel Prize winner for science. So not bad for a South Minneapolis high school. 
to produce people of that caliber was really amazing. Well, after I graduated from high school, uh, I took the tough route. I enlisted into the United States Navy, ironically, September the 11th of 1969, uh, at a time when it was not popular. The Tet Offensive had already happened over in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. The war had turned a little bit. It was no longer popular. We were really being lied to now. And I was one of them that uh, volunteered. Uh, when I got to boot camp, my lottery number came out. I think I was 273. They never got to triple digits, so I wouldn't have had to have gone. But proudly being a Navy man, we've never drafted anyway. The Navy has never needed to. Uh, most guys, when it gets down to brass tacks, would rather have three hots and a cot than to be laying in the dirt. <laughs> the Navy lets you sleep in a bed usually. But uh, from there in the Navy, I volunteered for what they call the Special Forces. You know of them today. Uh, when I was in, nobody knew of us, and that is the Underwater Demolition SEAL Team. Uh, we wore no emblems then, per se. We just wore marine greens. The only way we could be identified, we had jump wings. Uh, today, they've turned them, in my opinion, into the Green Berets. They've done the same thing to them. And why? Because they now fall under the Army. The Navy SEALs are the Navy, but they fall under the Army, and that's what happens. I've been to Fort Benning. No apologies to all you Army guys out there. But uh, I liked it better when we were solely with the Navy, and I liked it better when we were considered the quiet professionals. We didn't come home and write books. We didn't come home and look to Hollywood to promote us. In those days, nobody really knew we existed pretty much. Anyway, when I was discharged from there, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So uh, I had started riding motorcycles my last two years in the Navy, and I ended up uh, becoming a full patch member of one of the most notorious outlaw motorcycle clubs in America. I was third in command, the Mongols, the black and white. I believe you have them here in Colorado now. I'll have fun forever. Mongols forever, forever Mongols. Uh, anyway, though, there was a transition period. It was Vietnam. And let me tell you something, people. We didn't get parades. We didn't get thank you for your service. In fact, most of us didn't even acknowledge we were in the service for 10 years because we were blamed for the war. They blamed back then the soldier for the war, not who should have got the blame, which was the politician. Politicians start wars, soldiers don't. Soldiers are left to carry out. A war happens because politicians fail. Now, did you hear that? Wars happen because politicians fail. So with this stuff with North Korea now, if war happens, it will be because politicians have failed again. Because they're the failure that ultimately causes the wars. And then the poor, here's one thing I'll tell you. In my six years in the military, I never want, met one millionaire. In fact, I didn't even meet anyone who is considered exceptionally wealthy. Now, what does that tell you? Who's actually doing the fighting? Same as always, the poor people doing it for the rich. That simple, cut and dry. Rich people don't go in. I laugh today. I listened to the president yesterday talking about how veterans are the greatest people in the world. They're da 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 on and on and on, right? And then in a matter of 15 minutes, the whole crowd in Alabama's booing John McCain. Excuse me, last time I checked, he's a veteran. Last time I checked, the president was praising veterans. I guess they lose their veteran when they don't vote along with him. Then they're no longer considered, I guess. And as far as the president goes, all this hoorah about the military and how, how where's his two strapping boys? How come they didn't serve? How come he didn't? You notice that? The people that want to go to war and the people that start the wars are not the ones who fight them. They don't go. The rich don't go. The poor go. That's why I'm so anti-war today, and I encourage you all. There's a tremendous book 
written by Major General Smedley Darlington Butler. It was written about a hundred years ago. It's called War is a Racket. I urge, I believe that book should be mandatory reading for every high school senior to graduate, to be forced to read that book, War is a Racket. Now they've tried to take Major General Butler and downplay him and destroy his credibility in all this. They can't, you wanna know why? Major General Butler didn't win one, he won two Congressional Medals of Honor. Now how do you tell a two-time Congressional Medal of Honor winner he doesn't know what war is? So that's who I found, and I'll, I'll, politically today I'll tell you this, okay, they wanna build the wall. Well first of all, don't we have Houston, Texas, and Florida? I think we need to fix them. I think we ought to put the wall on hold for about a decade while we fix two major areas of our own country due to these hurricanes. And I will tell you this though, the wall will work. It will work, you wanna know how I know? When I was governor, I went to China and you have to go up the wall, Mao Zedong says you do. So I did, while you're there, when you're in their country, you do what they do. And so I looked at the wall and saw how massive it was. It goes up into the clouds. And I realized right there, it will work, I thought later. You want to know why I know it will work? Because to my knowledge, no Mexican has ever made it over the Great Wall of China. I think I can confidently say it stopped every Mexican from trying to get over into China. Now, maybe none have ever tried. I don't know that. <laughs> All I know is none have succeeded. How ridiculous. If I can make it clear, show me a 30-foot wall and I'll bring a 31-foot ladder. Give me a break. We want to spend our money on nonsense like that. And I'll follow with this. Who's going to do this cleanup? The white people? I think we should open our borders and bring the Mexicans up. We got a lot of work for them. Cleaning up Houston cleaning up Florida. We had a big storm in Minnesota by my golf course. I found it interesting. Hail, so a lot of homes needed to be re-roofed. All of a sudden I'm hearing this Mexican music every day because as I looked out at the roofers, they were all Mexican. So think of that people, when you wanna stop these immigrants from coming to our country, who's gonna do that work, you? Think about it. These are hard-working people. We want them. We don't want to turn. And let's remember something. Unless you're native United States, and we're all immigrants, aren't we? How quick we forget. And if they want to put this wall up, I'll tell you what then they need to do. Take down the Statue of Liberty. Take it down. Take it down. Why have a statue that's meaningless? That statue says, send us your poor. Send us your this, send us your that. Whoa, did you see the latest? Oh no, we only want college educated. You gotta have a job. You gotta be you know, on the up of the up. So what do we need with the Statue of Liberty anymore? The whole statue's bullshit now. If you wanna look at it, excuse my French. Anyway though, so when I was finished with the Mongols, naturally I got into the business that you probably almost remember me for, the world of pro wrestling. Many people ask me, how did you get in pro wrestling? And I give them a quick answer, I couldn't sing or dance. You know, no, actually I got into it because I had designs. I was a 23-year-old freshman in junior college and I thought I might try football. And I, got, I was on the GI Bill, so I really didn't have to uh, name a major or I could, I could do what I wanted on the GI Bill, take any classes to see what interests me. And believe it or not, I got into theater. I actually did Aristophanes' The Birds, a Greek comedy, and in college. But it was there that the transition of wrestling came in. I was in the weight room. They were all wrestling fans. So was I. There was a guy named Superstar Billy Graham then, who was my hero in the world of pro wrestling. And so I realized wrestling combined both athleticism and theater. Both. Two things I liked. And not only that, you didn't have to wear a helmet. 
They could recognize you. You could be creative. You didn't have to have the same jersey with just your name on the back, you know. And so I ventured out into the world of pro wrestling and had a 15-year career. I was on the ground floor when we went from 26 territories throughout the United States to basically one when Vince McMahon took over the world of wrestling. And that led me to the Hollywood career, Predator, Running Man, and doing a few films like that. I've had a multiple of jobs. I'm kind of a renaissance man. After about three to four years, I get bored, and it's time to move on and do something new. Uh, that's not for everybody, because it can be terrifying if when you leave one job and venture into a new one. You don't know if you'll be successful. I like to refer, I'm very much like Yogi Berra. Remember Yogi when he said, when you come to a Y in the road, take it? That's the kind of way I've lived life. When I come to a Y in the road, I take it. I'm not sure which Y, but once I'm on that and I've taken that turn, I continue on it till I'm successful with it, hopefully. And so, and I, and I didn't want to get, I'm 66 now, and I didn't want to 10, 15 years from now, if I'm fortunate to be here, to have to say woulda, coulda, shoulda. I didn't want to have to do that. I wanted to experience everything I can. So I got led into politics. How did that start? It started in a fight for a wetland in our neighborhood in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. Our city council wanted to give us concrete curb gutter and storm so we didn't need it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's how I work. And, uh, but they forced it upon us. I got involved up there and I looked at the 25 year incumbent one day and I said, you're gonna make me run against you, aren't you? His buddy on the council burst out laughing and said, you couldn't win. Well, guess who walked out of that council meeting that night knowing he was running for mayor? Well, I ended up winning, and I'll leave it to you since this is political and we're going to have governors up here, potential governors, possibly. I won 67% to 33 against a 25-year incumbent and won all 21 precincts. I believe they call that a major landslide when you win that big. And here's the thing that really got me. During the course of that mayoral campaign in 1990, it was nonpartisan, no parties, right? It's local level, no parties. Yet the Democrat and Republican leadership of Minnesota co-signed letters, sent them to every member, in this, every person in the city of Brooklyn Park, telling them to vote for the 25-year incumbent and called me the most dangerous man in the city. That's the label they gave me. Well, I didn't get offended because I thought for a moment I might be the most dangerous man in the city. I mean, after all, I'm a two-tour Vietnam veteran Navy SEAL. That makes me pretty tough, I think. And I also wrestled for 15 years. I might have been the most dangerous man in the city. I don't know. But uh, I ended up running, winning, served one term because... I am not a politician, I refer to myself as a statesman. Here's the difference. A politician makes it their career. A statesman serves and then goes back to what he or she used to do. I would rather have more statesmen than politicians personally. I don't like it when people make careers out of getting elected. And so I, I served my term as mayor I went, then I went into the talk radio realm, and I was actually doing sports talk four years later when, if you'll recall the 90s, economy was robust. I mean, everybody was making money in the 90s. Inflation was under 1%. The money's rolling in, right? Well, in the state of Minnesota, we ended up, I think, with a $2 billion something surplus. More money than they accounted for, you know, or budgeted for. I was doing radio then, and I thought, well, they've got all this excess money. What will they do with it? It should be given back, shouldn't it? If in the private sector, if you're overcharged by a company and you show them that they, they've overcharged you, they give you that, that difference back, don't they, in the private sector? Well, unfortunately, it don't work that way in the public sector always. They took the money and spent it, like kids in a candy store. Ooh, they had a couple extra billion dollars. 
And what you don't realize is generally when they spend it, it will come around again and you'll have to fund it again later when the economy maybe ain't so good. You're going to be stuck funding what they've spent the two extra two billion on. They should live within their budget. So I was on radio and I just made the statement when I talked about that money should have been given back to us. All I did was say, you know, maybe I ought to run for governor. Oh boy. It, it, it exploded. It then was I had to do it because I had put myself in a corner by just saying that. So lo and behold, I ran, and I'll never forget when I announced my candidacy on the steps of the Capitol, I think in January, February, it was cold. The first question I was asked was, because it was just me when I announced it, the first question the mainstream media asked me was, where's your family? Because you know how they always do those poses. They bring out the wife and the kids, and they got to portray themselves as the ultimate family person, you know, da-da-da-da-da, family values. I looked at the press and said, my family has nothing to do with this. This is the business of running the state of Minnesota. What does my family have to do with that? Nothing. So, uh, we, you know, I was laughed off. They thought it was a lark. They didn't think nothing, da 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 da. I went through all the early debates, this and that. It finally got to the primary, and I got it down to. Hubert H. Skip Humphrey III, the famous Hubert Humphrey's son, Democrat, and St. Paul Mayor Norm Coleman, later to become a senator. Those were my opponents. That's who I wanted. I wanted the two big boys. I wanted the two big boys. If you're going to beat them, beat the best, you know? And nobody thought I had a chance. And I only, here's something, here's a story I love to tell you. My dad was, a, well, I, I come from a family, my mother and father were both World War II veterans. Not many people can say their mom was. My mom was a nurse in North Africa prior to Normandy because North Africa was fought before Normandy, and that's where my mom was. My dad had six bronze battle stars, North Africa, Normandy, Battle of the Bulge, Remagen Bridge, Anzio, and Berlin, and lived. Well, when, when my dad got to Berlin, he never talked about the war much, but he did tell me about the love affair they had with the Russians when they, we all arrived there. Our allies. Our allies, the Russians. Let me repeat that again. Our allies, the Russians. And yet, before that war was even over, they became our enemy to this day today. Why? Why? Why do you think that happened? That was in my brain my entire adult life. I wanted to know why this happened. How could they be our ally defeating the Nazis, and before the last smoke had cleared, they became our enemy? Then, then there was a book I read on Alan Dulles, and that explained it all to me clearly. It comes down to Wall Street. Wall Street controlled us then like they control us now. And who is, does Wall Street fear the most? Anything social. Socialism. That is the biggest fear Wall Street has. They would rather get in bed with Nazis and fascists than they would a socialist. And because Russia happened to have a socialistic government different than ours, they automatically became our enemy because of Wall Street. That's where Alan Dulles came from, Wall Street. So it shows how long Wall Street has been controlling our country. And this is, and these Bitcoins and all this stuff I've learned can be the way around Wall Street. Around Wall Street. That's why I have a great interest in it and all that. So anyway, continuing on, I, that, that became something I wanted to know about. Why did Russia become our enemy? And like today, now they're saying Russia interfered in our election. Really? Did you elect the president? Any of you? None of you did. Why? We have a system called the Electoral College. You're irrelevant. It's how the Electoral College votes, not you. 
So unless Russia got to the Electoral College, how could they have possibly interfered in our elections? And they're saying they took out ads on the internet? Are you kidding me? After looking at the corporate ads I looked at that came out of our country that makes every opponent look like they belong in prison? You ever watch those ads, them distasteful, awful things? And they're gonna blame that Russia's ads were worse? I doubt it. No, this is what you got here. You got ineptness by the Democrats. They didn't run their anything good. They're killing the messenger, not the message. The thing that should be focused on is the message. What, ha what happened with the, those emails? It showed the Democratic primary was fixed. Bernie didn't have a chance. It was fixed. Shouldn't that be the story? And if Russia, if indeed Russia exposed this, shouldn't we be thanking them? And saying thank you, Russia, for showing that our election was rigged so that we can hopefully fix it before the next one. I'm tired of them blaming Russia. They want to start the Cold War again, and the Democrats are the worst offenders on this of starting it all up again. Two minutes, I go till I'm ready. <laughs> Nobody tells me when to shut up. <laughs> Anyway, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, so I'll, ba I'll regress a little. I did win governor, and as your governor candidates up here are going to find out, I'm going to be a hard guy to deal with with them. And here's the fact why. Going back to my father again for a moment, let's regress back to him. He only had an eighth grade education. And, but I found, he died in 91, and I found today, he gets smarter every day. Every day that goes by in my life, my dad gets smarter. And he's been gone for a long time. But my dad send, said to me one day, he said, all politicians are crooks. And I, of course, was in high school at the time, and I looked, I said, come on, dad. You can't make a blanket statement like that. They can't all be crooks. Certainly some could be. No, he goes, they're all crooks. You want to know why? I said, why? And in his, in his simplistic form, he looks at me and says, because they spend a million dollars for a job that only pays a hundred grand. Think about that a moment. In the private sector, would you ever spend more money than what you're going to make at the, to get the job? No. People would look at you and say, you're insane. You're going to spend this much amount of money to get a job that's only going to pay you this much, and you're going to lose money trying to get this job, but yet our political arena, that's what it is. Spend millions for a job that only pays 100 grand. Well, here's where I got your opponents, and here's where I got them all. When I ran for governor, I could look up to my dad, even though he was gone, and I could say, Dad, your son's not a crook because I made more money being governor those four years than what I spent to get it. I only raised $300,000 to become governor of Minnesota. I was paid $120,000 a year, so if my Roosevelt High School math is correct, that means I made $480,000 and only spent three hundred dollars to get it. I don't think there's another elected official in the last hundred years that can make that statement. I might be wrong, but I don't think so. You know, and so I never, because I never met with a lobby, I never then, that, this allowed me when I got in office, I went four years and never met with a lobbyist. I shut the door on them. I told my staff, I don't need to meet with lobbyists. They didn't elect me. So what do I need to talk to them about? Nothing. Tell them they're banned. They don't come in my office. Yep, yep, I'll, I'll finish. So on that note, they tell me that the potential governors have arrived. So uh, thank you very much for hearing my story. Uh, since then, I've had Conspiracy Theory, the TV show, which a lot of people loved. But boy, I got read off on the floor of Congress for that one. I was going places they didn't want me going. And, uh, and since then, of course, I've had the horrible lawsuit with the American sniper who lied and said that he beat me up in a bar. Right. 
you know. Well, it didn't happen, but it, I will tell you this, it destroyed my career. I have not been able to get a job since that story broke. Why? Because the fake media ran with it for over a year and destroyed me before I had my chance in court. I won in front of a jury. I won in front of a federal judge. And I will give Trump credit here. It all got overturned in the, in the appeals. They broke two of their rules to overturn my verdict. So yes, our courts are fixed, but they're fixed at the appeal level. There's where they're in the ivory tower. They're in there for life. They answer to nobody. So I have to retry the case again. Have to go back and do it another time. I don't mind. Now I'll prove twice he was a liar. And then everyone will know for sure. But I have, so why am I where I'm at now? The only job I could get was first an internet show called Off the Grid where my boss was Carlos Slim from Mexico and now Russian TV saw that show, picked it up and I now work for the infamous Russian TV and I'll finish with this. Who have given me my free speech. Mainstream media doesn't let me talk freely but the Russians do, and Vladimir Putin personally told me he will never interfere with my content or subject me to any type of censorship. And so far, he has not. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you, sir. Great to have you here. Whoa, are you glad you came? Yeah, all right. Well, we have now, talking about politics,